we have to learn about Thomas Sankara. After we, we have to learn about his homeland. Or actually, I don't know if it's his homeland. Um, I guess we'll find out. But we have to learn about Burkina Faso. All right, let's learn. Ooh. All right. Burkina Faso is a landlocked country in West Africa, bordered by Mali to the northwest, Niger to the northeast, Benin to the southeast, Togo and Ghana, the Ivory Coast, a population of 20 million. Previously called the Republic of Upper Volta, what a name, it was renamed Burkina Faso by President Thomas Sankara. We're going to learn about that guy. Its citizens are known as Burkinabe. Um, its capital and largest city is Ugadogo. Maybe. The largest ethnic group in Burkina Faso is the Mossi people, who settled the area in the 11th and 13th centuries, not the 12th. They established powerful kingdoms such as the Ogadogo, Tenkodogo, and Yatenga. In 1896, it was colonized by the French as part of French West Africa. In 1958, Upper Volta became a self-governing colony within the French community. In 1960, it gained full independence with Maurice Yamiogo Yame as president. Throughout the decades post-independence, I'm trying my best, guys. Oh my fucking god. You know if you got the average Vashet up here, they would be able to pronounce none of these. Oh my god. Ah uh, yes, all, all of my Burkina Faso viewers. <sighs> Throughout the decades post-independence, the uh, country was subject to instability, droughts, famines, and corruption. Various coups have taken place in the country. Oh my god. In 1966, 1980, 1982, 1983, 1987, an attempt in 1989, 2015, twice in 2022, once in January, and once in September 2022, which was literally last month. The 30th of September 2022, that was a week ago. A coup d'etat took place in Burkina Faso a week ago, removing interim president Paul Henry. Sandelgo de Miba over his alleged inability to deal with the country's Islamist insurgency. De Miba had come to power in his own coup d'etat just eight months earlier. Captain Ibrahim Traore took over as interim leader. Lieutenant Imbambe Lemonsen assumed deputy leadership of the National Transition Council that was formed by Traore after the coup d'etat. All right, well, stuff certainly is happening. Rapidly. That's cool. Wow. Um, I, get, I will learn about this in contemporary Burkina Faso, I think. Um, we're, let's not skip ahead um, too far. All right. Thomas Sankara served as the country's president from 1982 until he was killed in the 1987 coup led by Blaise Compaore, who became president and ruled the country until his removal in October 2014. Sankara had conducted an ambitious socioeconomic program, which included a nationwide literacy campaign, land redistribution to peasants, railway and road construction, the outlawing of female genital mutilation, forced marriages, and polygamy. Hmm. Burkina Faso has been severely affected by the rise of Islamist terror in the Sahel since the mid-2010s. Several militias, partly allied with ISIS, or Al-Qaeda, operate across the borders to Mali and Niger. Um, more than 1 million of the country's 21 million inhabitants are internally displaced persons. On the 24th of January 2022, the military and its patriotic movement for safeguard and restoration declared itself to be in power. Previously, the military had executed a coup against President Rohmark Kabore. On the 31st of January, the military junta restored the constitution and appointed Paul Henry Sandogo de Miba as interim president, who would serve as president until he was overthrown one week ago and replaced with military captain Ibrahim Traore. Man, stuff certainly is active over there. This certainly is a part of the world where things happen and are happening. Um, wow. Events are taking place. Burkina Faso is a least developed country. Wow, not even like developing, just like 
wh whatever the bottom of the bucket is, with a GDP of 16.2 billion. 54.5% of its population practices Islam and 233 practice Christianity. Due to French colonialism, the country's official language of government and business is French. There are 60 indigenous languages officially recognized by the Burkinabe government, with the most common language, More, spoken by over 50% of Burkinabe. The country is governed as a semi-presidential republic with executive, legislative, and judicial powers. Burkina Faso is a member of the UN, La Francophonie, and the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. It is currently suspended from the Economic Community of West African States and the African Union. Wow. All right. Uh, right. Okay. So this is more about Thomas Sankara than it is about Burkina Faso. So I'm not here to learn necessarily about Burkina Faso. But I think I do want to learn a little bit about its culture. Um, I think it's safe to say that politically, this, the politics I want to learn about will be covered in Sankara's Wikipedia article. So I'm going to learn a bit about other stuff that wouldn't necessarily be covered. Geography. What kind of country is it? I mean, you know, in this way. Lies between two terrestrial ecoregions the Sahelian Acacia Savanna, and the West Sudanian Savanna. Okay? A primarily tropical climate with two... I did a segment on it, C4. With two very distinct seasons. In the rainy season, the country receives between 0 0.6 and 0 0.9 meters of rainfall. In the dry season, the Harmatan, a hot dry wind from the Sahara, blows. The rainy season lasts approximately four months, and is shorter in the north of the country. Three climatic zones can be defined. The Sahel, Sudan Sahel, and Sudan Guinea. The Sahel in the north typically receives less than 6, 0.6 meters of rainfall per year, and has high temperatures. Relatively dry tropical savanna. Geographic and environmental causes also play a significant role in contributing to Burkina Faso's food insecurity. As the country is situated in the Sahel region, Burkina Faso experiences some of the most radical climate, climatic variation in the world, ranging from severe flooding to extreme drought. The unpredictable climatic shock that Burkina Faso citizens often face results in strong difficulties in being able to rely on and accumulate wealth through agricultural means. Burkina Faso's climate also renders its crops vulnerable to insect attacks, including attacks from locusts and crickets, which destroy crops and further inhibit food production. Not only is most of the population of Burkina Faso dependent on agriculture as a source of income, they also rely- oh, these people are fucked with climate change. They also rely on the agricultural sector for food that will directly feed the household. Why are we doing this, Omegalol? Knowledge is valuable for its own sake. Do you think so little of the people who live here? Do you think yourself more valuable than them? Due to the vulnerability of agriculture, more and more families are having to look for other sources of non-farm income and often have to travel outside their regional zone to find work. Natural resources include gold, manganese. This is what they make manga out of. Fascinating. Okay, but why the particular interest in this place? If you make an effort to learn something every day, you will eventually know lots of useful things. But I am learning about Thomas Sankara, a Marxist revolutionary. This is the country uh, in which he did his revolutionary business. If you know about the country, you'll know more about why he had to do what he did. Burkina Faso has a larger number of elephants than many countries in West Africa. Lions, leopards, and buffalo can also be found here, including the dwarf or red buffalo, cheetah, the caracal or African lynx, the spotted hyena, and the African wild dog, one of the continent's most endangered species. Four national parks. Their economy. I assume we can look through the economy section and summarize it as, the economy is completely fucked. In 2018, tourism was almost non-existent in large parts of the country. Yes. That makes sense. It's a, uh, a, a an interminably uh, coup-locked country that's under attack by ISIS. Here is the value of Burkina Faso's exports. We have gold, making up nearly four-fifths of it, which is insane. 
then raw cotton, um, just to draw some more direct parallels to our own historical systems. Zinc ore, refined petroleum, refined. Okay, well they can refine it, I guess. Raw zinc. Yeah, this is um, this is not a developed economy. The 2018 CIA World Factbook. Thanks, CIA. Provided this updated summary. Burkina Faso is a poor, landlocked country that depends on adequate rainfall. Irregular patterns of rainfall, poor soil, and lack of adequate communications and other infrastructure contribute to the economy's vulnerability to external shocks. About 80% of the population is engaged in subsistence farming, and cotton is the main cash crop. The country has few natural resources and a weak industrial base. Cotton and gold are Burkina Faso's key exports. The country has seen an upswing in gold exploration, production, and exports. Man, from what I'm reading here, I'm kind of getting the feeling that this might end up being one of the uninhabitable parts of the world when climate change continues to ramp up. If the climatic region is so um, tumultuous that it's not really possible to do agriculture there, like, it might literally not be a place that can support human civilization. At least, but not most of it, you know? Um, depending on how bad things get, they really seem to be getting to. Food insecurity. The European Commission expects that approximately half a million children under age 5 in Burkina Faso will suffer from acute malnutrition in 2015, including around 149,000 who will suffer from its most life-threatening form. Rates of micronutrient deficiencies are also high. According to the Demographic and Health Survey, 49% of women and 88% of children under the age of 5 suffer from anemia. 40% of infant deaths can be attributed to malnutrition, and in turn, these infant mortality rates have decreased Burkina Faso's total workforce by 13.6% demonstrating how food security affects more aspects of life beyond health. While services remain underdeveloped, the National Office for Water and Sanitation, a state-owned utility company run along commercial lines, is emerging as one of the best-performing utility companies in Africa. That's good. High levels of autonomy and a skilled and dedicated management have driven ONEA's ability to improve production of and access to clean water. Since 2000, nearly 2 million more people have access to water in the four principal urban centers in the country. The company has kept the quality of infrastructure high. Less than 18% of water is lost through leaks, one of the lowest in sub-Saharan Africa, improving financial reporting and increasing its annual revenue by an average of 12%, well above inflation. Challenges remain, including difficulties among some customers in paying for services, not surprising, with the need to rely on international aid to expand its infrastructure. The state-owned, commercially-run venture has helped the nation reach its Millennium Development Goal target in water-related areas and has grown as a vital company. Access to drinking water has improved over the last 28 years. According to UNICEF, access to drinking water has increased from 39 to 76% in rural areas between 1990 and 2015, and from 75 to 97% in urban areas. Bosh, I think it would be valuable if we learn more about African history and geography in general, useful against racists. Like, I can only learn so fast. We'll get to, we'll do, what we, I'll, I'll, I'll learn as I can. You can't really learn about Africa, right? I mean, you can learn about hundreds of countries and movements and armies and wars in Africa, but you can't really just learn about a continent. Um, that's, it's a pretty broad subject. I, I wouldn't feel comfortable with, like, the degree of abstraction that would be, you you you'd you'd really have to like I guess simplify stuff, but I, I you could you can learn like case studies, right? Burkina Faso is a secular state. I'm surprised to hear that, where most people are concentrated in the south and center, where their density sometimes exceeds 48 inhabitants per square kilometer. Hundreds of thousands of Burkinabe migrate regularly to Ivory Coast and Ghana, mainly for seasonal agricultural work. In 2015, most of the population belonged to one of the two West African ethnic cultural groups, the Voltaic and the Mande. Voltaic Mossi make up about 50% of the population and are descended from warriors who moved to the area from Ghana around 1100, establishing an empire that lasted over 800 years. The total fertility rate in Burkina Faso is about six children per woman, the sixth highest in the world, though many of those kids will not survive. Slavery continues to exist in Burkina Faso, 
and Burkinabe children are often the victims. Slavery in the Sahel states in general is an entrenched institution with a long history that dates back to the trans-Saharan slave trade. In 2018, an estimated 82,000 people in the country were living under modern slavery, according to the Global Slavery Index. The average life expectancy in 2016 was estimated at 60 for males and 61 for females. The under-5 mortality rate and the infant mortality rate were 76 per 1,000 live births. The median age of its inhabitants was 17. Wow. In 2014, central government spending on health was 3% in 2001. As of 2009, studies estimated there were as few as 10 physicians per 100,000 people. In addition, there were 41 nurses and 13 midwives per 100,000 people. Statistics on religion in Burkina Faso can be misleading because Islam and Christianity are often practiced in tandem with indigenous religious beliefs. The government of Burkina Faso's 2006 census reported that 60.5% of the population practice Islam, and the majority of this group are Sunnis, while a small minority adheres to Shia Islam. A significant number of Sunni Muslims identify with the Tijaniya Sufi order. The government estimated that 23.2% of the population are Christians, 19% being Roman Catholics and 4.2% Protestant denominations. 15.3% follow traditional indigenous beliefs, such as the Dogon religion, 06 have other religions, and 04 have none. High school costs approximately 50 US dollars per year, which is far above the means of most Burkinabe families. Boys receive preference in schooling. As such, girls' education and literacy rates are far lower than their male counterparts. An increase in girls' schooling has been observed because the government's policy of making school cheaper for girls and granting them more scholarships. National exams. The UN Development Report Pro, uh, Program Report ranked, wow, ranked Burkina Faso as the country with the lowest level of literacy in the world, despite a concerted effort to double its literacy rate from 12.8% in 1990 to 25.3% in 2008. Literature based on oral tradition, influence on writers, theater of Burkina Faso, slam poetry is increasing in popularity in the country in part due to the efforts of slam poet Malika Otara. There's a large artist community in Burkina Faso. They host an international arts and crafts fair. The cinema of Burkina Faso is an important part of West African and African film industry. Many of the nation's filmmakers are known internationally and have won international prizes. Popular television series. Sports. Music, which has its own section. Media. Okay. We now know a tiny bit about Burkina Faso. Since we've learned about the country before Thomas Sankara, um, perhaps we should, uh, we should do the tradition by looking at Burkina Faso on Google Maps. If Burkina Faso even is on Google Maps, we might just have to look at photos. There are a couple of spots in Burkina Faso that we can look at. Very few. I don't think we're learning much from this. Well, we're learning that it's quite beautiful. Wow. We are learning rock. It really is quite pretty, though. This type of rock, the, the kind that has these, like, um, like layers, like sandwich boards layered on top of each other, um, I always see this in, like, Africa, or, like, art of Africa. I, don't, I assume it has something to do with, like, the tectonic plates or some, like, five trillion years ago, some specific chemical mixture in the, in the sedimentation or whatever, but... Um, I always thought it was really pretty. I will admit, however, that um, stuff like this just creeps me out. I need to be near mountains, so I feel uncomfortable. Being in like the um, the African savanna, where there's no mountains nearby, would make me very uncomfortable, personally. Prey mindset, yeah. I have to, I have to find like a tree to climb up or something. Yeah. It is a landlocked country. I would not like to be in a landlocked country. Uh, you know, not to say they've, like, had a choice in the matter. Um, hold on. 
There are a couple more to look at here. I don't know how much we're going to see. Ooh. The photos that we're seeing here are, I assume, from Westerners who visit. Or at least, like, you know, not um, Birkenau people. Um, what about flatland makes you uncomfortable? I just grew up around mountains. Um, you know? I think humans have, like, an innate desire, to an extent, to be around stuff that's a little bit taller than them, to kind of shelter them, so it's a little bit like being in a room all the time. Because there have been studies done on, like, the optimal levels of comfort when it comes to the width of streets and the heights of buildings. And humans seem to, like, reliably like being around some stuff that, that kind of, like, encloses them a little bit. Um... Obviously, that's like a personal a personal preference thing, but it's it, you know it seems to be like a reliable enough that you can statistically demonstrate that tendency. Um, unfortunately, yeah, I don't think we're getting any city shots here. Wow, do not drink this water. Beautiful though. Oh, hello. Yes, I think these are Westerners who are taking their panoramic photos. This is uh, not an area of the world that people with money visit that often. Uh, if we want to see their cities, we are going to need to go to Google Image Search. Where is their capital? Like here, I mean. Um, oh, there it is. O, uh, uh, o uh, do -do. All right, let's see what we've got. We have here a cathedral. Admittedly, in my opinion, uh, quite a beautiful one. Wow. Um, shame that it's just like in the middle of a parking lot. That kind of sucks. But the building itself is uh, really pretty. I like that a lot. Yeah, this is like, this to me looks like, I guess, the, the archetypal, like classic desert temple, but in the best possible way. You know what I mean? It looks like something that Indiana Jones would stumble across after like an earthquake reveals a mountain pass. You know, like he, he like brushes some vines aside in front of him and he sees this in the middle of like a city of gold. It's beautiful. It looks like it tastes good. Yeah. It looks like somebody took a bite off this uh, over here. I don't know if this is deliberate asymmetry or if there was a concern. Okay. So a lot of Google image search result results are showing me this. This seems to be, this is the Memorial of the Martyrs. Okay, so this is some kind of memorial, I see. I will admit that I don't like it very much. Uh, it's not to my preference, you know? I don't, I don't, I don't want to be like, a, you know, like a beggars can't be choosers kind of guy. You know, this, this country doesn't have that much money to throw around. But, you know what, it's theirs, and if they like it, then, yeah. However, this, I, like, just judging from what I know about, like, Sub-Saharan African countries that undergo coups every five minutes. This was probably like a dick-waving expenditure, right? Like, this was probably like a military junta was like, we will build a glory to my, to my rule or something. So he built this thing and it bankrupted the country or something like that. I guess we'll learn about it and we'll find out. I, c I can tell that this place is really poor because only a couple of things reliably show up. Like, there's not that much to take photos of. There seems to be an intersection that has like this this kind of cool um like stacked pottery thing, which I which I like a lot. Um I, I like it. I think it looks nice, you know, just kind of like this little city marker. Let's get let's get like a broader city shot here. This is why I like doing it through Google Map. You can get you can learn a lot more from, from Google Map, I think. Google Maps than you can from just like the photos that everyone takes. So here's the city. You can find pictures of Bobo Dialasso. Wow, look at this. The Grand Mosque of Bobo Dialasso. This is wild. This is kind of like an African brutalist vibe here. I don't know how old this is, but uh, that's... Uh, here, this shows its, its size a little bit better. What an interesting bit of architecture. It's quite imposing. I mean, it looks quite old. I don't know if this is recent construction. Um... If it was, then I, I, would, I would ask questions about, about a few things. Is it for climbing? No, I think it's for looking dope. Dude, what? Okay, I, I'm kind of getting behind this, like, traditional African brutalist architecture. 
I know it's not literally brutalism. It's just what I think about when I see it, you know? This is kind of dope. It's like, it's like somebody took the logic of a sandcastle and just, like, escalated the concept, you know? Um, that's really cool. I, yeah, I like this a lot, you know? I assume that it's made out of, um, mud or clay. Like, it's, it's made out of some, it's, it's, I don't think it's made out of stone bricks, because it looks like it's smooth, and you can see that the towers taper the further up you go, which suggests clay construction. Probably pretty old. Here's one in Mali. Okay, so this so this is probably tied to like a specific ethnic, um, indigenous, like architectural tradition. I like it a lot. I think I think this is cool. Um, yeah, these are imperial buildings from the medieval era. Nope. I believe it's linked to the Mali Empire. Well, they were doing stuff. All right, last hail mary for the pictures here. Burkina Faso pictures. What do we got? Honestly, a lot of what I'm looking at is, like, military stuff, coups, and, um, very, very, very poor black people. I gotta say, though, can we, can, is there, what's wrong with white people, man? How is it that these guys in Burkina Faso are legit, like, some of the poorest people on earth? And they're so much more drippy than white people are over here. Look at all the clothing colors. They're not wearing fucking khakis and like white, uh, white, um, polo shirts or whatever, you know? The only reason I bring that up is because I know, if I remember correctly, like from the very, very, very little I know, African dress, I'm saying this is so broad, like African, right? But like broadly, African, like clothing places a high priority, I think, on, like, color through expression in a way that we don't. Right? Because if, if you, if you, I don't know, like, I feel like oftentimes it's like, you, you look like African, like, like, fashion traditions or whatever. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. I guess, I guess if you go, like, a couple hundred years back, like, you'll have Dutch people, like, dancing around in, in, in hoity-toity, like, red, blue, and gold clothing, but, yeah, I don't know. Is this a cow? Oh my god. This is the most emaciated cow I've ever seen in my life. You can't even, what can you even use this cow for? Are you, is, is this cow gonna be slaughtered for its meat? Jesus. Probably not. It's for work. What work with these limbs? Yeah, I guess it's for milk. No, it's not. It doesn't have udders. It, it does it? Maybe. Well, I don't know how much milk something this skinny could produce. Anyway, you can see it's ribs. It's a cow. All right. I think we've done enough lead up. Um, I think it's time to learn about Sankara. First things first. Handsome dude. Hard to get around that. You know, he's got, he's got like the Castro energy or like the um, Che Guevara energy of like, you, you get a beret, like you look dope as hell. Absolutely. Always good for the fascist leaders to be like fat, moldy little beetle men and for all the like Marxist revolutionaries to be these like dope guys in their early 30s with beards. All right, we're going to learn. <sighs> Thomas Isidore Noel Sankara was a Burkinabe military officer, Marxist revolutionary, and Pan-Africanist who served as president of Burkina Faso from his coup in 1983 to his deposition and murder in 1987. Viewed by supporters as a charismatic and iconic figure of revolution, he is commonly referred to as Africa Che Guevara. After being appointed prime minister in 1983, disputes with the sitting government led to Sankara's eventual imprisonment. While he was under house arrest, a group of revolutionaries seized power on his behalf in a popularly supported coup later that year. At 33, he became the president of the Republic of Upper Volta, he immediately launched programs for social, ecological, and economic change and renamed the country from the French colonial name Upper Volta to Burkina Faso, land of incorruptible people, with its people being called Burkinabe, upright people. His foreign policies were centered on anti-imperialism while he rejected aid from organizations such as the IMF, based. 
Sankara welcomed foreign aid from other sources, but tried to reduce reliance on aid by boosting domestic revenues and diversifying the sources of assistance. Very smart. His domestic policies were focused on preventing famine with agrarian self-sufficiency and land reform. Hold on. Somebody in chat. Sigh. Vosh is going to find some fringe fact about this non-American leftist and is going to call him a bad tanky and fash. Man, come on. I don't try to do the hero worship stuff on my stream. You have to understand that, like, most leaders of most countries throughout history have been massive pieces of shit, you know? Like, I may have criticisms of Castro, but, like, considering what he replaced, or, like, Ho Chi Minh, but considering what he replaced, right? Like, my, my, my concern is, like, what can we learn from these guys, right? There are very few people, historically, like, you look back and it's like, oh, yeah, they were just, like, great, you know? The, the thing is, like, the, the issue I find is, like, when I looked at South Africa the other day, the guy for the fucking, um, the economic freedom fighters, what was his name again? That guy, like, literally isn't a leftist. Like, nothing that he does is about leftist economic policies or progressivism. All of it is just wanting to kill white people. Um, yeah, fucking Blitler over there. So, he, so in, sometimes, like, let, like... The main problem is that a lot of lefties are very undiscerning with who they worship, and it makes me uncomfortable, like, I need to learn more, you know? But I've heard a lot of good about Sakar, which is why I want to read up on him. It's also important to understand that when you're dealing with countries that are as fucked as Burkina Faso, like, it's not possible to be a perfect leader in the way that, like, we envision or dream of, right? Like, the, in, in environments like this, there's basically no way to do anything good without also doing bad things. It's basically impossible, you know. Um, and as a as a as an advocate for pragmatism, uh, you know, I, I can I can understand this, even if it is unfortunate. Okay. His domestic policies were focused on preventing famine with agrarian self-sufficiency and land reform, prioritizing education with a nationwide literacy campaign, and promoting public health by vaccinating more than 2 million children against meningitis, yellow fever, and measles, which saved the lives of 18,000 to 50,000 children annually. His government focused on building schools, health centers, water reservoirs, and nearly 100 kilometers of rail with little or no external assistance. Total cereal production rose by 75% between 1983 and 1986. I think cereal production refers to a type of grain, not like breakfast cereal. Other components of his national agenda uh, included planting over 10 million trees to combat the growing desertification of the Sahel, redistributing land from private landowners, suspending rural poll taxes and domestic rents, and establishing a road and railway construction program. On the local level, Sankara called on every village to build a medical dispensary and had pharmacies built in 5,300 out of 7,500 villages. Wow. From 1982 to 1984, the infant mortality rate dropped from 208 per 1,000 births to 145. Wow, in two years, he dropped it by like a third. School attendance other, under Sankara increased from 6% to 22%. Moreover, he outlawed female genital mutilation, forced marriages, and polygamy. He appointed women to high governmental positions and encouraged them to work outside the home um, and stay in school. As an admirer of the Cuban Revolution, Sankara set up Cuban-style committees for the defense of the revolution. As such, he prioritized gender equality, slashed the wages of his top officials, and set up popular revolutionary tribunals to prosecute public officials charged with political crimes and corruption, considering such elements of the state counter-revolutionaries. The latter program led to criticism by Amnesty International and other non-government organizations for violation of human rights, who alleged there were a number of extrajudicial executions and arbitrary detentions of political opponents. I would not, I, I would need to look more into this before I could, like, effectively rule on it. However, Amnesty International is also the group that just played defense for Russia um, with their bullshit fucking article on Ukraine. So, you know, not exactly disposed towards them uh, right now either. Sankara's revolutionary programs for African self-reliance made him an, uh, an icon to many of Africa's poor. And Sankara remained popular with a considerable majority of his country's citizens, though some of his policies alienated elements of the former ruling class. Uh -huh. These antagonistic groups included the Burkinabe oligarchy, the tribal leaders, who were stripped of their long-held traditional privileges of forced labor and tribute payments, 
and the governments of France and its ally, the Ivory Coast, which had previously dominated the nation through colonial power. Can you imagine being a socialist revolutionary who has to strip power from tribal leadership? That's like, this is just such a... Such a thing that I have never had to think about. I have never thought about the material conditions of socialist revolutionaries going up against literal tribal leaders who have caste slaves as a, like, internal agitation, you know? I mean... On the 15th of October, 1987, Sankara was assassinated by troops led by Blaise Compaore, who assumed leadership of the state shortly thereafter. Let's learn about this guy. Real quick. Just like, he led a coup d'etat, he introduced a policy of recidification, overturning the leftist and third worldist policies pursued by Sankara. He won elections in 1991, 1998, 2005, and 2010 in what were considered unfair circumstances. He attempted to amend the constitution to extend his 27-year turn, which led to an uprising. Okay, so he's just a fucking dictator. Like, that's it. Like, just... The BBC noted in 2014 that this guy was the strongest ally to France and the U.S. in the region. What do you guys want to bet that the Ivory Coast and other allies to colonial powers had Sankara murked um, and this guy took over? It's not like we weren't uh, fond of replacing, like, revolutionary leaders at the time. Pretty sure that's confirmed. I want to learn more about the death of Sankara. I guess we'll learn more if we go further down. It's not even conspiratorial. France was openly involved in installing him. Great, gotcha. Thomas Sankara was born Thomas Isidore Noel Sankara in 1949 in Yako, French Upper Volta, as the third of ten children to Joseph and Margarita Sankara. His father, again, Durame. What is that? Military force with law enforcement duties. Military police. His dad was military police. He attended primary school. He chose to enter the military. Entered the academy. 20-year-old Sankara went on for further military studies in the academy of Antsirabe. Antsirabe. Military career. He fought a border war between Upper Volta and Mali by 1974. He earned fame for his performance in the conflict, but le years later would renounce the fighting as useless and unjust, a reflection of his growing political consciousness. He also became a popular figure in the capital of Ugadogo. Sankara was a decent guitarist. He played in a band named Tutaku Jazz and rode a bicycle. Fuck yeah, dude. This, it's just a natural, like, compo like, all Marxist revolutionaries just have to lay good dick. And be cool, you know? Like, it's just part of the... Sankara was appointed Minister of Information in Sai Zerbo's military government in September 1981. Sankara differentiated himself from other government officials in many ways, such as biking to work every day instead of driving a car. While his predecessors would censor journalists and newspapers, Sankara encouraged investigative journalism and allowed the media to print whatever it found. Wow. This led the publication of government scandals by both privately owned and state-owned newspapers. He resigned on the 12th of April, 1982, in opposition to what he saw as the regime's anti-labor drift, declaring misfortune to those who gag the people. After another coup brought to power Major Dr. Jean-Baptiste Oudraugo, Sankara became prime minister in January 1983, but he was dismissed. In between those four months, Sankara pushed Oudraugo's regime for more progressive reforms. Sankara was then arrested after the French president's African affairs advisor, Guy Pen, met with Colonel Yorian Somme. Henry Zongo and Jean-Baptiste Bokari Lingani were also placed under arrest. The decision to arrest Sankara proved to be very unpopular with the younger officers in the military regime, and his imprisonment created enough momentum for his friend Blaise Compare to lead another coup. A coup d'etat organized by Blaise Compare made Sankara president on the 4th of August, 1983, at the age of 33. The coup d'etat was supported by Libya, which at the time was on the verge of war with France in Chad. Sankara saw himself as a revolutionary and was inspired by the examples of Fidel Castro and Che Guevara, and of Ghana's military leader, Jerry Rawlings. I know nothing of Jerry Rawlings at all. 
As president, he promoted the democratic and popular revolution. The ideology of the revolutionary, oh, sorry, the ideology of the revolution was defined by Sankara as anti-imperialist in a speech on the 2nd of October, 1983. The Discours d'Orientation Politique, written by his close associate, Valéry Somme. His policy was oriented towards fighting corruption and promoting reforestation. On the 4th of August, 1984, the first anniversary of his accession, he renamed the country Burkina Faso, meaning the land of the upright people, gave it a new flag, and wrote a new national anthem. His first priorities were feeding, housing, and giving medical care, launched a mass vaccination uh, program. Large-scale housing and infrastructure projects were also undertaken. Brick factories were created to help build houses in an effort to end urban slums. That's a big deal, right? Because oftentimes in poor countries, when the population is too large to, for the housing to accommodate it, they'll find like, they'll find like corrugated metal and like cloth tents and stuff like that. You know, like they'll, they'll pull together scrap for housing. But if you have like bricks that are just like freely available, like, like all over the place, it's way easier to build like stable, enduring housing that you can, um, that, that can insulate you against the weather. That's, uh, that can be like, um, made watertight in the rainy season, you know, like stuff like that. In an attempt to fight deforestation, the People's Harvest of Forest Nurseries was created to support 7,000 village nurseries, as well as organizing the planting of several million trees. All regions of the country were soon connected by a vast road and rail building program. Over 700 kilometers of rail was laid by Burkinabe people to facilitate manganese extraction in the Battle of the Rails without any foreign aid or outside money. These programs were an attempt to prove African countries could be prosperous without foreign aid or help. Sankara also launched education programs to help combat the country's 90% illiteracy rate. These programs had some success in the first years. However, wide-scale teacher strikes, coupled with Sankara's unwillingness to negotiate, led to the creation of revolutionary teachers. In an attempt to replace the nearly 2,500 teachers fired over a strike in 1983, anyone with a college degree was invited to teach through the revolutionary teachers program. Volunteers merely received a 10-day training course before beginning to teach. Um, what were the teachers complaining about? Uh, he says there were teacher strikes, but what, what... Because they were being worked harder? Might not have been getting paid enough. Oh, yeah, the, um, the uh, Burkina Faso... Um, Anthem. the original is this is this did did sankara write a vocaloid track yes okay man he really was a man of the future he really was a man of the times 1980s producing like a synth vocaloid track I don't like it. Is this really the original? Fuck, it is. Yeah, okay, well. Here's the Navy Band version. You just gave me a Wikipedia link. Someone like this earlier? Ah, oh, well, well, here they're... they're... Okay, Sankara, Sankara era recording. Okay, so wait, this would have been the original? Like, like, this is the official, but this would be, like, the original? Now this is revolutionary audio. I 
think we get the point. Toot. Shortly after attaining power, Sankara constructed a system of courts known as the Popular Revolutionary Tribunal. The courts were created originally to try former government officials in a straightforward way so the average Burkinabe could participate in or oversee trials of enemies of the revolution. They placed defendants on trial for corruption, tax evasion, or counter-revolutionary activity. Sentences for former government officials were light and often suspended. The tribunals have been alleged to have only been show trials, held very openly with oversight from the public. According to the U.S. State Department, a trustworthy source on this issue, if ever there was one, procedures in these trials, especially legal protections for the accused, did not conform to international standards. Defendants had to prove themselves innocent of the crimes that were, um, they were charged with committing and were not allowed to be represented by counsel. The courts were originally met with adoration from the Burkinabe people, but over time became corrupt and oppressive. So-called lazy workers were tried and sentenced to work for free or expelled from their jobs and discriminated against. Some even created their own courts to settle scores and humiliate, humiliate their enemies. Um, I am willing to bet that this ended up getting pretty bad. But I, I, I'm kind of curious. The only source we have here is better source needed. And we're also talking about, like, revolutionary activity in a desperately poor country 40 years ago. I don't know how much... The, the main issue that I have is that, like... Do you think the U.S. State Department was commenting on the legal proceedings that were taking place in Burkina Faso before Sankara? Like, do you think that defendants in Burkina Faso were being given, like, international standards for criminal defense before, and the U.S. State Department only spoke up now because, under Sankara, the standards dipped? Or do you think there's a political reason why the U.S. State Department might be interested in speaking negatively of a Marxist revolutionary's, uh, revolutionary tribunals? The problem that I have is, like, it's, like... It, it, the, the like the U.S. State Department doesn't speak up on all of the injustice all around the world, but they do find time to comment on the goings ons of Marxist revolutionary states. You know, so I'm willing to bet that there was quite a lot of bad done here. I want to learn. I want to learn more about this. We're earmarking this for future investigation. The committees for the defense of the revolution were formed as mass armed organizations. The CDRs were created as a counterweight to the power of the army as well as to promote political and social revolution. The idea for the Revolutionary Defense Committees was taken from Fidel Castro, whose committees for the defense of the revolution were created as a form of revolutionary vigilance. Sankara's CDRs overstepped their power and were accused by some of thuggery and gang-like behavior. CDR groups would meddle in everyday life of the Burkinabe. Individuals would use their power to settle scores or punish enemies. Sankara himself noted the failure publicly. The failure of the CDRs, coupled with the failure of the Revolutionary Teachers Program, mounting labor and middle-class disdain, as well as Sankara's steadfastness, led to the regime partially weakening in Burkina Faso. Better source needed. The same better source needed. Both of which cite a California newsreel? But when I click on the link, it just brings you to the modern newsreel page? Okay. So, both of the overtly critical sections of this Wikipedia article refer to one source that doesn't directly link, that presumably doesn't even work anymore, and even Wikipedia itself acknowledges that you need a better source. Honestly, I'll learn more, but I don't know how much I can trust this. We'll earmark that. Relations with Mossi people. A point of contention regarding Sankara's rule is the way he handled the Mossi ethnic group. The Mossi are the most populous ethnic group in Burkina Faso, and they adhere to strict traditional hierarchical social systems. At the top of the hierarchy is the Morho Naba, the chief or king of the Mossi people. Sankara viewed the institution as an obstacle to national unity and proceeded to demote the Mossi elites, and he was right to do so. The Morho Naba was not allowed to hold courts, and local village chiefs were stripped of their executive powers and given to the CDR. Okay. That's fine. That apparently means king of the world. Mm. Improving women's status in Burkinabe society, 
was one of Sankara's explicit goals, and his government included a large number of women, an unprecedented policy priority in West Africa. His government banned female genital mutilation, forced marriages, and polygamy while appointing women to high governmental positions and encouraging them to work outside the home and stay in school, even if pregnant. Sankara also promoted contraception and encouraged husbands to go to market and prepare meals to experience for themselves the conditions faced by women. Sankara recognized the challenges faced by African women when he gave his famous address to mark International Women's Day on the 8th of March in Ogadogo. Sankara spoke to thousands of women in a highly political speech in which he stated that the Burkinabe revolution was establishing new social relations, which would be upsetting the relations of authority between men and women and forcing each to rethink the nature of both. This task is formidable but necessary. Furthermore, Sankara was the first African leader to appoint women to major cabinet positions and recruit them actively for the military. The Agashir Strip War. This is a conflict with Mali. Feeling threatened by Sankara, Traore began preparing Mali for hostilities with Burkina Faso. Three groupements were formed and planned to invade Burkina Faso and converge in the city of Bobo Violaso. Once there, they would rally Burkinabe opposition forces to take Ogadogo and overthrow Sankara. Former Sankara aide Paul Michaud wrote that the Burkinabe president had actually intended to provoke Mali into conflict with the aim of mobilizing popular support for his regime. According to him, an official and reliable Malian source had reported that mobilization documents dating to the 19th of December were found on the bodies of fallen Burkinabe soldiers during the ensuing war. Sankara's efforts to provide evidence of his bona fides were systematically undermined. It is hard to believe that the Malian authorities are unaware that the rumors circulating are false, said U.S. Ambassador... Le Wait, really? U.S. Ambassador Leonardo Neher? A CIA cable states the war was born of Bamako's hope that the conflict would trigger a coup in Burkina Faso. Okay, so even the CIA admits that the Mali leader was spreading rumors in, in the hope that it would destabilize um, Sankara. Okay, so, wow, okay. If the CIA is willing to confirm, like, yeah, the Marxist uh, revolutionary is getting shafted here, then that's probably, uh, you know. At dawn on the 25th of December, 1985, about 150 Malian army tanks crossed the frontier and attacked several locations. Malian troops also attempted to envelop Bobo Diolasso in a pincer attack. The Burkina Faso army struggled to repel the offensive in the face of superior Malian firepower and were overwhelmed on the northern front. Malian forces quickly secured the towns of Dionoga, Selba, Kona, and Dona in the Agashir. The Burkinabe government in Ogadogo received word of hostilities at about 1 p.m. and immediately issued mobilization orders. Various security measures were also imposed across the country, including nighttime blackouts. Wagadogo. Wagadogo. Burkinabe forces regrouped in the Dionoga area to counterattack. Captain Compeore took command of this western front. Under his leadership, soldiers split into smaller groups and employed guerrilla tactics against the Malian tanks. Immediately after hostilities began, other African leaders attempted to initiate a truce. On the morning of the 30th of December, Burkina Faso and Mali agreed to an ANAD brokered ceasefire. By then, Mali had occupied most of the Agashir Strip. Over a hundred Burkinabe and approximately 40 Malian soldiers and civilians were killed during the war. The Burkinabe towns of Ohigoya, Gibo, and Nasambao were left badly damaged by the fighting. At an ANAD summit in Yamusokro on the 17th of January, Traore and Senkara met and formalized an agreement to end hostilities. The ICJ later split the Agashir. Mali received the more densely populated western portion, and Burkina Faso, the eastern section, centered on the Beli River. Belai? Belai River. Both countries indicated their satisfaction with the judgment. Burkina Faso declared the war was part of an international plot to bring down Sankara's government, not unlikely. It also rejected speculation that it was fought over rumored mineral wealth in the Agashir. The country's relatively poor performance in the conflict damaged the domestic credibility of the CNR. Some Burkinaba soldiers were angered by Sankara's failure to prosecute the war more aggressively and rally a counteroffensive against Mali. It also demonstrated the country's weak international position 
and forced the CNR to craft a more moderate image of its policies and goals abroad. The Burkinaba government made little reference to supporting revolution in other countries in the conflict's aftermath, while its relations with France modestly improved. At a rally held after the war, Sankara concluded that his country's military was not adequately armed and announced the commutation of sentences for numerous political prisoners. Ah, so this conflict served its goal then. Even if it was a brief fight between Burkina Faso and Mali, it made Burkina Faso look weak, um, which, um, which weakened Sankara's government and um, uh, uh, hampered international ambitions on the part of the revolutionaries. Sankara defines his program as anti-imperialist. In this respect, France became the main target of revolutionary rhetoric. These attacks culminated in Francois Mitterrand's visit in Burkina Faso in November 1986, during which Sankara violently criticized French policy for having received Pieter Botha, the Prime Minister of South Africa, and Jonas Savimbi, the leader of UNITA in France, both covered in blood from head to toe. French economic aid was reduced by 80% between 1983 and 1985. Guy Pen, President Francois Mitterrand's advisor on African affairs, organized a media campaign in France to denigrate Thomas Sankara in collaboration with the DGSE, which provided the press with a series of documents on supposed atrocities intended to fuel articles against him. A program of cooperation with Cuba was set up, after meeting with Fidel Castro, Thomas Sankara sent young Burkinabis to Cuba in September 1986 to receive professional training and to participate in the country's development upon their return. The latter must be volunteers and are recruited on the basis of a competition with priority given to orphans and children from rural and disadvantaged areas. Some 600 teenagers have flown to Cuba to complete their schooling and receive professional training to become doctors, engineers, agronomists, or gynecologists. Denouncing the support of the United States to Israel and South Africa, he called on African countries to boycott the 1984 Summer Olympics in Los Angeles. At the UN General Assembly, he also denounced the invasion of Grenada by the United States, which responded by implementing trade sanctions in Burkina Faso. That's it? They, they're sanctioning Burkina Faso for denouncing an invasion? Jesus fucking Christ. Also at the UN, he called for an end to the veto power granted to the great powers. In the name of the right to peoples to sovereignty, sovereignty, he supported the national demands of the Western Sahara, Palestine, the Nicaraguan Sandinistas, and the South African ANC. While he had good relations with the Ghanaian leader Jerry Rawlings and Libyan leader Mu uh, Muammar Gaddafi, he was relatively isolated in West Africa. Leaders close to France, such as Houphouët Boigny in Côte Livore and Hassan, Hassan II in Morocco were particularly hostile to him. In the 1980s, when ecological awareness was still very low, Sankara was one of the few African leaders to consider environmental uh, protection a priority. He engaged in three major battles against uh, bushfires, which will be considered as crimes and will be punished as such, against cattle roaming, which infringes on the rights of people because unattended animals destroy nature and against the anarchic cutting of firewood, whose profession will have to be organized and regulated. As part of a development program involving a large part of the population, 10 million trees were planted in Burkina Faso in 15 months during the revolution. To face the advancing desert and recurrent droughts, Thomas Sankara also proposed the planting of wooded strips of about 50 kilometers, crossing the country from east to west. He then thought of extending this vegetation belt to other countries, Cereal production, close to 1.1 billion tons before 1983, will rise to 1.6 billion tons in 1987. Jean Ziegler, former UN Special Rapport for the Right to Food, emphasized that the country had become food self-sufficient. Impressive. Criticism. Ooh. The British development organization Oxfam recorded the arrest of trade union leaders in 1987. In 1984, seven individuals associated with the previous regime were accused of treason and executed after a summary trial. Wait, are we substantiating this? Hold on. It doesn't link to the... Why were the trade union leaders arrested? Isn't that important? 
Uh, uh, people were accused of treason and executed. A teacher strike in the same year resulted in the dismissal of two and a half thousand teachers. Therefore, non-governmental organizations and unions were harassed or placed under the authority of the Committees for Defense of the Revolution, branches of which were established in each workplace and which functioned as organs of political and social control. The problem is, man, I need to know more about this stuff before I can really levy criticism. If a bunch of teachers are striking because, like, they just don't want to teach, even if they're being worked harder, like, you you kind of have to fire them. Like, you need to educate your people, right? Um, depending on, like, what were their demands? Sankara wasn't interested in negotiating. What were the demands of the teachers? What did he not want to negotiate on? Like, what circumstances led to this point? What were they complaining about? I don't know. I will say, however, the fact that these criticisms are being levied by imperial powers, even if Oxfam is a relatively decent source. This is an official document about the teacher strike. The National Union of African Teachers of Upper Volta lodged a complaint of violation of freedom of association on the 10th of March, 1984. Freedom of association? It further submitted info in support of its complaint and further allegations and communications dated back to the world. The complaint's allegations. It's been known to happen, Bolshevik Y2K. In their initial complaint to the World Confederation of Organizations of the Teaching Profession and its member org in Burkina Faso, the National Union of African Teachers of Upper Volta denounced the arrest by the government at their homes on the evening of the 9th of March, 1984, of Jean. Panim da Bila, General Secretary of the SNEAHV, the Hill Secretary of Human Relations, Secretary of Pedagogical Problems, the Secretary of the Union was escaped. What is this? The SNEAHV? Oh, that's the National Union. Right, okay. So some of the members of the National Union of African Teachers of Upper Volta were arrested. Interned in a barracks in the Airborne Infantry Battalion. The union called a 48-hour protest strike, which was widely followed. So the teachers actually striked because some of the leaders of the unions they were a part of had been arrested. But why were they arrested? Man, okay, what's the name of these union leaders? Um, Jean Pagnimda Bila. Okay, we'll start with this person. Why were they arrested? Interim report. This is also from the F... Wait, this is from the same thing! This is also from the same, the same case text from the International Labor Organization. This is the problem with doing research in countries like Burkina Faso. Like, a lot of this shit happens literally in fucking dirt villages. Like, there's not that much... I don't know. I, I literally don't think there's enough information... To, to, like, to, like, learn. Why were they arrested? Yeah, and the primary sources are going to be in French. Maybe bring someone on to talk about it. No, no, no. I'm not getting drawn into the infinite rabbit hole here. Also, bringing somebody on with expertise on the specific National Union of African Teachers of Upper Volta union leaders who were arrested. Would you ever justify arresting union leaders? Yeah, they're, they're citizens. They can be arrested for doing bad things. That's why I want to know why they were arrested. I'll have to leave that for a bit. Popular revolutionary tribunals set up by the government throughout the country place defendants on trial for corruption, tax evasion, or counter-revolutionary activity. Procedures in these trials, especially legal protections for the accused, do not conform to international. We've read this. According to Westerners, the climate of urgency and drastic action in which many punishments were carried out immediately against those who had the misfortune to be found guilty of unrevolutionary behavior bore some resemblance to what occurred in the worst days of the French Revolution during the Reign of Terror. Although few people were killed, violence was widespread. Source? So few people were killed, but violence was widespread? How do, how do you parse that? So, like, in a, in a numerical, empirical sense, things weren't that bad, but in, like, another, more spooky sense, they were bad? from an OECD report. And are they going to source? It seems based on 573, they were arrested for no reason since they were not placed on trial. You can arrest people without placing them on trial while still having a reason for their arrest. 
Also, I refuse to believe that Sankara ordered the arrest of teachers' union leaders for literally no reason. Even if it's a bad reason, I want to know what it is. There had to be some internal justification for that behavior. Whatever. Okay, so here's, here's what we know, okay? Did Thomas Sankara do good and bad things? Probably. However, all the good things affected millions of people are widely documented, easy to cite, easy to source, understood. Um, and all the bad things are like, B based on hearsay and decades old documents that you would have to translate out of French and a lot of them come from Westerners. So that, you know, that, so that, you know, take from that what you will. Why would you take them to a non-territorial military base if you had a reason to arrest them? I don't, I don't know. It's, it's Burkina Faso. I have no idea what the state of their prisons are like. The government's reply? In a telegram, oh, are we going to learn? In, uh, in a telegram the 23rd of March, in response to that of the Director General, the government, without denying the arrest and internment of the three members, stated the measures were taken, uh, were motivated by the political rather than the trade union activities of the persons concerned. It furthermore stated that in proclamation of the 4th of August, the National Revolutionary Council had suspended political parties and banned political activities. So, the 4th of August, 1983, how soon... How, 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 like, when was Sankara, um, put into power again? He was made president on August 4th, 1983, but then, yeah, okay, so August 4th, 1983, and this was 23rd of March, 1984. No, wait, in its proclamation, of the 4th of August, 1983, the National Revolutionary Council had suspended political parties and banned political activities. Okay, so the claim here is that um, uh, Thomas Sankara is saying they were arrested for political organizing, uh, which is in violation of uh, a proclamation made when Sankara achieved power. So what did they actually say? What were their, what were their political organizing? Let me see. In its letter of the 5th of June 1984, the government repeats its statements concerning the political rather than trade union nature of the activities of the arrested leader. It outlines the general situation in the country, explaining that after the popular uprising on the 4th of August, which brought Sankara's government into power, Bosch, yeah, su suspending all political parties and banning political activities pretty bad. Honestly, it can be justified. You, you have to understand, the, the problems I have with suspending political activity are done in the context of Western democracies or countries where there's some, like, some moat of political stability. This is a country with 10% literacy um, that has like been violently colonized for basically its entire history that has nothing uh, and is constantly under threat of being like overtaken by the remnants of its former corrupt governments. Um, uh, under these circumstances, this is what I mean by like, it's impossible to do good. If you're weak as a Marxist leader in an area like this, you're just going to be assassinated. That's what happened to Sankara. He was assassinated by the fucking French. Um, this is, when, when lefties say, like, this bit of authoritarianism was justified by the external material conditions, this is one of the circumstances where I fully fucking agree. Like, France, uh, like, America did, uh, uh, did a trade sanction because they denounced the U.S. invasion of Grenada. France withdrew a fuck ton of its foreign aid. There were remnants of, like, corrupt colonial former governments. They were surrounded by French allies who were fucking with them from around the border. Giving the, like these conditions, Sankara like uh, knuckled down. He said like, "No, fuck you guys. I'm going to do this." And then he made the country better. Under these circumstances, I think it's defensible because what's the alternative? Like getting bogged down in an attempt at just instantly creating a liberal democracy, then getting like assassinated by some guys who don't give a shit, and then they take power. Like, no, there's no way to do like anything reasonable here without some kind of like authoritarian imposition. It's unfortunate, and it's not desirable, but it's also like, I don't even know. Now, that's to say this can be justified. Obviously, like, there are points where it's not justifiable. Like, I'm okay with, under these circumstances, if you, like, arrest political opponents for, um, for, like, collaborating with colonial allies, like, I'm okay with that. If you're arresting people because they're, like, holding your own officials to account for their corruption, I'm not okay with that. Like, obviously, this can still be done poorly. I'm just saying there are venues in which this is not only, like, desirable, but inevitable. You could make the same arguments about the Soviets when they killed the anarchists. No, you couldn't. 
The anarchists participated in the revolution and they were just fucking murdered for no reason when the revolution ended. No, please think for a second, please. Please, you're not everywhere in the world is like the Western democracy that you live in, okay? Think, the conditions here are completely different. This would be more like Lenin arresting like czarist allies, which he did. Like that, that would be more comparable. I imagine like post-revolutionary Russia that has one fiftieth the wealth. Nobody knows how to read any language, um, and uh, all your people are starving. And also, like, there are a ton of, like, czarist allies everywhere who are still trying to organize your overthrow. It is totally different. Um, yeah, keep in mind, the American Revolution involved the suppression of, like, the political power of British colonial agents. You realize that, right? The argument for killing anarchists was calling them czarist imperialist allies? Yeah, and they were wrong. You realize that just because the Leninists misuse the argument that I'm making doesn't mean they were right to do it, right? Like, I'm okay with killing people in self-defense, but that doesn't mean I'm okay with, like, a cop gunning down an unarmed black guy because he thought he saw a gun in his pocket or something. Like, um, well, that's the defense they use. Like, please, come on, guys. Yeah, during the uh, Civil War, uh, Lincoln literally, like, jailed secessionists in the Union. Um, Lincoln, uh, they, they barred, uh, Confederate, uh, representatives from, um, from Congress. They got kicked out for secession, which was dope. Yeah. Oh no, that's actually bad. That's, that's, you're, you're, you're stopping your political opponents. Yeah, he suspended habeas corpus. I'm just, I'm just asking you guys to, like, think of this from a different, like, lens. How do you draw the line between arresting legitimate opponents and calling people from the party? There's no easy answer to that. It's always difficult. Like, that's like asking me, like, well, how do you draw the line between, like, doing a good and a bad revolution? Like, that's, that's really difficult. Like, that's why I'm looking at this. Um, I'm saying that things are so fucked in Burkina Faso that I think there are perfectly justifiable reasons to suspend, like, um, like, uh, like other forms of political organization, considering the conditions the country was in, you know? Um, like Zelensky's literally doing this. You realize that, right? Zelensky literally has barred, um, pro-Russian political parties from operating within Ukraine. And you guys defend that, don't you? Because you understand that, um, the, the luxury of free, open political expression is something that is not as present under dire circumstances like invasion. Um, Burkina Faso is sort of, I guess, being invaded here by a, by a thousand conceptual things. Sorry, I don't mean to get angry at chat. I know I rail against tankies a lot, but I, like, we shouldn't, let's not, let's not rail against tankies all the way into being liberals, you know? Um, okay, sorry, I'm sorry for being mad. I love you all. That being said, this could still be bad of Sankara. Um... I'm not saying that he's automatically right here. I'm just saying I, that's why I want to know. I want to learn here. In its letter of the 5th of June, 1984, the government repeats its statements concerning the political rather than trade union nature of the activities of the arrested leaders. It outlines the general situation in the country, explaining that after the popular uprising of the 4th of August, which brought the new government to power, the, tra the teachers' union, as early as the 7th of August, provoked it by denouncing as undemocratic Captain Sankar's proclamation of the um, in a motion of the national situation. The motion amounted to accusing the new government of representing the fascistic wing of the Supreme Revolutionary Council, which had already distinguished itself by its dictatorial inclinations, mystification, and political scheming. The teachers' union um, went on to say, considering that the following proclamation makes a mockery of personal, collective, trade union, and democratic freedoms, which are not even mentioned, considering that this proclamation constitute an attack on fundamental freedoms, which it is destroying by dissolving the official political parties and setting up machinery for recruitment in the form of revolutionary defense committees of sad renown elsewhere. The teacher's unions uh, uh, disassociated itself from the proclamation, warned the authorities against infringements of personal, collective, trade union, and democratic freedoms, affirmed its constant readiness to set up a front so workers may safeguard their freedoms, and called upon the people of Upper Volta and the democratic and mass organizations to dissociate themselves from the proclamation and from the National Revolutionary Council, which is no more than another name for the fascism already famous as the Supreme Revolutionary Council. Okay, you know what I'm getting from here? I'm getting here an insincere liberal attempt to, um, to scream like fascism the moment like leftists do anything. 
Burkina Faso did not have a functioning democracy beforehand. Essentially, the teachers' union said, as Thomas Sankara like, took to power, they were like, we reject all of this authoritarianism, this is fascism, but in what ways did Sankara meaningfully infringe on the freedoms of these people? Um, this is like, yeah, the, the fucking day of Sankara taking to power. Um, this is like, a, this is like, man, I don't know, I want to know more about the history of this teachers' union, but what do you want to bet that these guys were like, pretty fucking cozy with colonial powers? Um, and now they suddenly have an issue with like uh, deviations from democratic rule. The moment it's like being done in the form of uh, of, of like Marxist organization. Well, maybe we can find out. They have Upper Volta in their name. Yeah, but that might be vestigial. At the time, the name hadn't even changed. National Union of African Teachers of Upper Volta. Hold on. The 1980 Upper Volta coup d'etat took place on the 25th of November 1980 in the Republic of Upper Volta, today Burkina Faso. Following a long period of drought, famine, popular unrest, and labor strikes, Colonel Se Zerbo overthrew President Sungole Lamizana, another military leader. Zerbo would be overthrown two years later himself. And his overtaking was supported by the school teachers. So the school teachers' union backed through their strike. Zerbo achieving power. And what was this guy like? Zerbo initially had the support of the trade unions, as Lamizana once had after his 1966 coup, winning the support of the striking teachers by giving in to most of their demands. What demands? Seems like these uh, teachers have quite a lot of power in Burkina Faso. Why is there no info here on his political positions? What did he do? Oh, that's interesting. Zerbo staged a coup against President Lamizana, who'd been re-elected democratically. So these democracy-obsessed teachers supported a military coup against a democratically elected leader. And then when, uh, when Sankara uh, um, suspends other political activity and buckles down on making the country better, all of a sudden they take issue with it. Oh no, hold on. The trade unions in the country, I assume this includes the teachers' union as well, opposed the seizure of power, though they had supported Zerbo for a long time. Okay, wait. So the teachers' unions striked against the pre-existing leader and then got along with the, the leader who did a coup, but they didn't support the coup itself? Wait, do, wait, did, did, did the trade unions have all the power in fucking Burkina Faso? Yeah, with the support of unions and civil groups, Colonel Sai Zerbo overthrew Lamizana in a bloodless military coup in 1980. But then this guy later got cooed. Man, we are learning shit today. Yeah, maybe, Thana. And then this guy got cooed by the guy who would later get cooed by Sankara, Odrogo. On the whole, CSP exercised true control of the government while Odrogo served as little more than a figurehead. The freedoms of labor unions and the press having been restricted under Zerbo's reign. Wait, Zerbo was supported by the labor unions, but Zerbo also restricted the freedoms of the labor unions? Oh, this is too complicated for me to get with all this missing information. Trade unionism in Burkina Faso. From the late 1980s to the late 1990s, trade unions were engaged in a struggle for democratization. This is after Sankara. Now, this is after Sankara, see? From the late 1980s, this would be after. I saw Antifa. Man, what the fuck? I, I guess, man, I don't know. Just, I'm trying to put my, I'm trying to think for, for a second, okay? Burkina Faso does not have a functioning democracy, right? Like, their literacy rate at the time was like fucking 5%, like back in the 1970s and shit. They don't have a functioning democracy. There are tribal leaders that rule everything. Women have no rights or what? Like, not everything is fucked. And then, like, you're Thomas Sankara. 
And because you're like a charismatic revolutionary leader, you take power. And like, there have been 57 coups in the past eight minutes. I don't know how much I would value like democratic freedoms over like stability for the time in my reign. Like, I don't know if I would think like, yeah, I, like in this environment, I'm just gonna like, I'm just gonna like let the status quo of infinite coups and like just constant like post-colonial interference continue so that I get to be leader for four minutes, you know? I, I feel like this is one of those times where you can make a really strong argument for going like, okay, this country is so fucked that I genuinely think that being like the charismatic benevolent dictator is the only thing I can really do. I think it's also worth pointing out that from what we've read, he isn't even like He's not like an authoritarian by political trade, is he? Um, he had a political cabinet. He encouraged freedom of the press. Um, he was interested in in like promoting diversity within his cabinet, um, and and like the, like uh, 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 taking apart the old like um, tribal systems that were authoritarian in nature. Like it seemed like everything he did, like broadly, was anti-authoritarian. He just had to, like, maintain stable control of the country to do so. And I guess, I guess I'd guess ask, like, what is the alternative, right? Like, because, like, Burkina Faso is so flimsy that you could just, like, blow on it and it'll topple over. I don't know what else you're supposed to do. I don't know. You can say the same thing about Lenin. No! Stop! Not everything is the same as every other thing. Lenin took over a partially developed Russia. Russia's economy and civic society were le and literacy were legions ahead of Burkina Faso. They also weren't anywhere near the same threat of like foreign interference or everything. They, in so many ways, it's different. Lenin had the ability. There were already workers' councils that were in line with the interests of the revolution. There were already the anarchists. They could have formed part of like a, a political coalition, a political bloc um, that... Um, that, uh, that, that could have led the country collectively. This is not the same. Please, I, I encourage people to engage in nuance in my channel. Like, do not do this, like, arrogant Western thing of, like, oh, Thomas Sankara improved everyone's standard of living while under, like, horrendous conditions, but he had to, like, be a bit authoritarian to do it. Hm, won't support. Like, the reason that I dislike Lenin isn't because he got authoritarian, it's because he did when he didn't have to. Lincoln got authoritarian. He suspended habeas corpus. I support him. Zelensky got authoritarian. He suspended the uh, right for pro-Russian parties to operate in the country. Washington got a little authoritarian uh, uh, in, in, in sort of like guerrilla activities across the American countryside to prevent like um, loyalist sympathizers from exercising political power. They had to do these things. They have to do these things because the alternative is just losing. Lenin didn't have to fucking kill all the anarchists and then disband the workers' councils. There was no reason to do that apart from his paranoia and his power mongering. And why you hate Tito? Because Tito didn't have to do a lot of the horrible shit that he did. Ah, uh, guys. Uh, it's seriously, like, like my position that I've always held clearly, like, how many times have I said, I don't think like Republicans can fairly run in, in America today because anti-democratic parties shouldn't be able to run democracy. And you guys are like, you're right, that's so based. You realize what I'm advocating there is like a necessary restriction of political freedom to preserve political freedom, right? Like, this isn't new to the channel. I have always believed that it is possible to do things that are sometimes unsavory, but at other times necessary and inevitable for doing good. What do you think wars are? Like, I don't support killing people, generally, but like World War II, you know, civilians shouldn't die, but it's an inevitable consequence of uh, invading or, 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 or like uh, Bernan Sherman going south or whatever. Why can't people understand nuance? Well, a lot of the people who are mad in chat are, um, are liberals who like are only on board with the stuff that I say when it overlaps with their progressive... Tito was in control of the Balkans, plus the USSR said it. No, 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 no! I'm not saying that Tito should have been and had the ability to be, like, a perfect, like, democracy lover or whatever. But he did lots of shit he didn't have to. That's another research stream. Stop.
Westerners struggle to understand some authoritarianism is inherent to all functioning political systems. Well, it should be reduced as much as possible. But like, obviously, in, in like times of extreme instability, we suspend democracy, right? When countries are in total war, we expect governments to restrict information and for the press to have um, censors put on them. This is unfortunate, but also, if you don't want to lose the fucking war, you need to do that. Same with Zelensky suspending opposition political parties or, or Lincoln doing the same with the Confederates. Um, like, it's not good, it's not fun, but it's something you sometimes have to do to do what needs to be done. And Sankara was oper operating under far worse conditions than anything that we have to deal with here in the West. Issued national international warrant for the arrest of the general secretary. According to the government, this attitude to the fact the executive of what is now the complainant union was then in the hands of politicians committed to the political party which supported the government of the day. They infiltrated thousands of the union's members, keeping them silent despite the most unpopular anti-labor measures. Consequently, the government goes on. This trade union executive in unmasking himself has revealed his true colonialist and reactionary political colors, and the National Revolutionary Council and the people of Burkina Faso can do no other than fight them like all politicians who, for decades, have worked to preserve their own selfish interests, the detriment of the people who are left in depri deprivation and want. So the government's claim essentially is that, yeah, um, the union leaders were counter-revolutionaries who were sympathetic to, like, um, authoritarian governance. And, um, and they were organizing opposition against Sankara's government uh, to destabilize, like, the, the revolution. The committee notes with grave concern that the complaints presented in this case contain serious allegations concerning the imprisonment of four trade union leaders, interned by the administrative authorities since, in the case of at least two of them, dismiss some 2,600 teachers for having taken part in a two-day protest strike organized by the complainant union to secure the release of the uh, leaders. The committee notes the government's explanations as to its motives in taking such measures. Allegations concerning the internment of trade union leaders by the administrative authorities. The committee notes the government has not imputed any specific acts, violent or otherwise, to the persons concerned and has merely referred to an anti-government text contained in a trade union motion drafted on the 7th of August, 1983, three days after it came to power in a populist uprising and seven months before the arrest leaders in question. Noting the strong turn of the motions, the government itself states its proclamation spent political parties ban political activities. The committee considers that such an attitude on the part of the government could not be conducive to a new climate propitious to the safeguarding of democratic and consequently trade union freedoms. I just really want to know how much of this is the trade union guys being like part of the economically elite caste who are mostly concerned with safeguarding their own interests. They've had a lot of influence in the overthrow and power of previous Burkina Faso leaders. And I'm willing to bet that in a country with illiteracy rates this high, the teachers that are there are probably teaching disproportionately well off tribal authorities or like wealthy people trade union does not necessarily mean like union is the way that you guys think yeah i don't know yeah so if if the country has like is like 90 percent illiterate like these people are probably teaching the relative elites and i wonder if they're more concerned about their economic freedom like than anything else you know colonial educators catholic priests is more likely yeah i wish i could find some kind of like direct info on the uh, teachers union of upper volta or whatever Seems like trade unions are pretty powerful and widespread in Burkina Faso. Hold on. Burkina Faso teacher union. I gotta say, for a teacher's unions, these guys sure do find themselves at the heart of a lot of political conflict. Burkina Faso teacher trade unionists work for democracy despite numerous political crises. That like they're they're not just teachers. They're this is obviously like a politically powerful institution. You know whether you think that's good or bad. Like this is not just like like the U.S. teachers union, where it's literally just a group of teachers. You know this is like a political power block. Man, they keep doing this. Even back in 2011, Burkina Faso teachers strike union agrees deal. Teachers in Burkina Faso government reached a deal to end a strike, which has led to riots. God damn. The government has agreed to all the union's demands for higher allowances. Okay, so for their own pay. That's good. Well, it can be good, but if the teachers are already a part of the economic elite, I mean, then that would be the equivalent of, like, cops, like, cops having a strike until they get paid more. Like, keep in mind, things are different here. This is not, this isn't American politics. You can't just transpose everything we have. This is broad, but what specifically? Last two pages? When did this come out? 
When was this article? What year? It says Burkina Faso, so it was after Sankara took power. What year? I'm guessing from from the, the way the pages were scanned that this is probably sometime in the 90s. Just sometime after Sankara was deposed, is my guess. In most of Africa, the trade union movement has little independence and less clout. clout. But in Burkina is different. Here, individual unions thrive and are an important element of the nation's political life, in the cities at least. The teachers' union, closely linked to a political party associated with one of the pre-revolutionary regimes, was the first to come out in opposition to the Sankara government. When their leaders were arrested in March 1984, the teachers went on strike. The government retaliated by firing 2,600 of them. Initially, the Confederation of Burkinabe Unions supported the revolution, but soon changed their mind. By early 1985, there was a broad trade union front denouncing the government for the constant worsening of the disastrous conditions of life of the working masses. These motherfuckers are counter-revolutionaries, 100%. By every standard we know, by every standard we can see, uh, Thomas Sankara raised the standard of living for the working class in Burkina Faso. These motherfuckers were the bourgeois. These trade unionists were the few people in Burkina Faso with some degree of economic and political organization, and they didn't like a Marxist being in power. 100%. And now we know, like, this is why you have to be suspicious, right? Like, oh, uh, Western governments clutch their pearls in sigh and desperation as the poor, innocent teachers' union in Burkina Faso has its leaders arrested, and then it turns out the teachers' union is like a petite bourgeois economic political body that had close ties to the pre-revolutionary government and like broadly opposes uh Sankara's government like 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 as a block, you know? And and then it's like, well, hold on. To what extent is this really about political freedom, which has never been present in Burkina Faso ever, so I don't know why they're throwing a fuss now. Um and to what extent is this just using like the 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 bad faith appeal to liberal um, you know, like liberal ideology as a way of like undercutting a successful Marxist Marxist regime. So they're a French puppet org? No, I just think they're I just think these are like the, the economically well off. Like this is these are the well to do cast um of Burkina Faso. They're just a little bit better off. Teachers are by definition literate and educated. Any teacher in Burkina Faso would have to be far better off than the masses of Burkina Faso, who like again widely illiterate, like subsistence farming, you know, I mean, practically feudal in terms of economic development. And then you have the teachers, um, and the teachers are quite a bit better off. And maybe they don't like the fact that now you have a Marxist leader who is not only like destabilizing old power, uh, tribal power, like bourgeois power, um, but he's also giving more power to the working class and demanding more of the teachers, you know? Right, sorry, sorry, not bourgeois, the professional managerial class. Thank you, thank you. Much better, yes. Um, not bourgeois, the professional managerial class, the, the, the labor aristocracy who have enough knowledge and expertise to, um, to guide the direction of the country. In the context of African politics, Burkina's trade unions may indeed hold an unusual if not unique place in the national scene. For one thing, they are now the only people's movement outside the popular front. But the working masses they claim to represent are in reality no more than a small minority consisting almost entirely of salaried urban workers. Yeah, in a country where the majority of the population is subsistence farmers out in the countryside, this is literally the group of, like, educated elites who don't like a Marxist being in charge. Fuck these pieces of shit. Fuck them. No fucking wonder Sankara's government arrested their leaders. Yeah, this is exactly what Sankara was trying to prevent. This is exactly what people like Sankara try to prevent. Like, oh yeah, we're just a bunch of good faith, freedom-loving uh, trade unionists who definitely aren't like attached to the old modes of power. The conflict between Sankara and the trade unions intensified from 1985, with many union leaders arrested and tortured. Probably shouldn't torture people. Was this a factor in his downfall? All that is known is that Blasé Compaore began to distance himself from Sankara's bitter campaign before the coup and has since sought to bring the unions back into the fold. So, Blasé Compaore, this is like the authoritarian who, like, led for 27 years and, like, cheated in every election, right? So, yeah, this is the guy that the freedom-loving teachers union backed and worked with. This guy who ruled for 27 years, uh, built a closer relationship with the fucking West, um, and uh, had a bunch of rigged elections. 
Yes, truly, the, the, the Teachers Association was, uh, look at this, 83 coup, 87 coup, and then the elections, um, and then he tried to extend his fucking term of office constitutionally. This man killed Thomas, yeah. Yeah, this is the guy who got Sankara into power, but then, like, took over from Sankara. Deteriorating relations with France and neighboring Ivory Coast was the reason given for the coup. Compaore described the killing of Sankara as an accident, but the circumstances have never been properly investigated. Upon taking the presidency, he reverted many of the policies of Sankara, claiming that his policy was a rectification of the Burkinabe Revolution. He accidentally killed 12 people along with Sankara also. Oh, nice. He actually moved to reinstate the teacher union leaders like three years later, but Blaise Campore's allies were against a lull French article. What? I'm getting a privacy error on this site. Probably not. Look, whatever. We're, 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 we're so in the weeds right now. Anyway, Campore began to distance himself from Sankara's bitter campaign for the coup and stopped bringing unions back to the fold. It may appear one of the ironies of the revolution that the trade unions have been rehabilitated under a regime dedicated to state capitalism after being hounded under one ostensibly committed to supporting the workers through class struggle. But for Sankara, the workers meant the 90% of his people living in the rural areas, while under Campeore, the center of political gravity has reverted to the cities, where the unions can play their power games. It's really all quite logical. Okay, well now we know. Whatever you might think of Sankara's behavior, the teachers' union and the strike that followed was the, um, the professional managerial class revolting against a leader that dared to care about the overwhelming majority of the Burkina Faso, um, population. Ugh. We're not even close to being done with Sankara's article, but I already feel like I... Uh. Here, this is where we were. Personal image and popularity. Accompanying his personal charisma, Sankara had an array of original initiatives that contributed to his popularity and brought some international media attention to his go government. Cuba rewarded Sankara with the highest honor of the state, the Order of Jose Marti. This is, uh, if you were wondering why um, Nelson Mandela did so much appeasement to the Western powers, this is fucking why. This is what happens when you're an African leader that is authentically socialist in your governance. Uh, and and you do not like attempt to meet halfway with um with the imperial powers. He sold off the government fleet of Mercedes cars and made the Renault Five the cheapest car sold in Burkina Faso at the time, the official service car of the ministers. He reduced the salaries of well-off public servants, including his own salary, and forbade the use of government chauffeurs and first-class airline tickets. He opposed foreign aid, saying that he who feeds you controls you. He spoke in forums like, uh, like the Organization of African Unity against what he described as neocolonialist penetration of Africa through Western trade and finance. He called for a united front of African nations to repudiate their foreign debt. He argued that the poor and exploited did not have an obligation to repay money to the rich and exploiting. In Ouagadougou, Sankara converted the army's provisioning store into a state-owned supermarket opened everyone, the first supermarket in the country. He forced well-off civil servants to pay one month's salary to public projects. He refused to use the air conditioning in his office on the grounds that such luxury was not available to anyone but a handful of Burkinabes. As president, he lowered his salary to $450 a month and limited his possessions to a car, four bikes, three guitars, a refrigerator, and one broken freezer. Just an unfathomably based man. Just like an incomprehensibly based guy. He required public servants to wear a traditional tunic woven from Burkinabe cotton and sewn by Burkinabe craftsmen. He was known for jogging unaccompanied through Wogadogo in his tracksuit and posing in his tailored military fatigues with his mother of pearl pistol. Oh, dope. Wait, hold on. I googled Sankara pistol and the first thing that came up was this guy with a fucking guitar. Hell yeah. Absolutely. I don't see any mother of pearl pistol, but of course, every single picture of this guy, like he looks like a massive badass. So actually, this image is so low res that I don't know which of these two is him. I assume it's him because he's speaking. I'm trying to see if I could find the pistol. Man, he was just a fucking kid. Seriously. I mean, look at him. 
When asked why he did not want his portrait hung in public places, as was the norm for other African leaders, Sankara replied, there are seven million Thomas Sankaras. This is why I don't think he was of an authoritarian disposition. Every single thing that he did in his governance seemed like it was like it seemed like it was ideologically against authoritarianism. The only authoritarianism he engaged in was like a was a was a pragmatic measure to try to like impose stability long enough for him to do things good. Um but he didn't it didn't seem like he attempted to like force a statewide cult of personality, you know? Outside the cult of personality that he got just by being like a cool dude, you know. An accomplished guitarist, he wrote the new national anthem himself. Sankara is often referred to, honored 20th anniversary. Assassination. On the 15th of October, 1987, Sankara was killed by an armed group with 12 other officials in a coup d'etat organized by his former colleague, Lase Campeore. When accounting for his overthrow, Campeore stated Sankara jeopardized foreign relations with former colonial power France. I mean, yeah. And neighboring Ivory Coast. Literally, like, killed. Like, guys saying, like, yeah, we're killing you because you're not nice enough to your former colonial masters. And accused his former comrade of plotting to assassinate opponents. Prince Johnson, a former Liberian warlord allied to Charles Taylor and killer of the Liberian other president Samuel Doe, whose last hours of life were filmed, okay, told Liberia's Truth and Reconciliation Commission that it was engineered by Charles Taylor. After the coup, and although Sankara was known to be dead, some CDRs mounted an armed resistance to the army for several days. According to Helena Traore, the sole survivor of Sankara's assassination, Sankara was attending a meeting with the Concile de Letant. His assassins singled out Sankara and executed him. The assassins then shot at those attending the meeting, killing 12 other people. It was an accident, guys. Sankara's body was riddled with bullets to the back and he was quickly buried in an unmarked grave, while his widow Maryam and two children fled the nation. Campeora immediately reversed the nationalizations, hmm, overturned nearly all of Sankara's policies, rejoined the IMF and World Bank to bring in desperately needed funds to restore the shattered economy, and ultimately spurn most of Sankara's legacy. Then he remained dictator for 27 years, until he was overthrown by protests in 2014. Well, there you go. In 2017, the Burkina Faso government officially asked the French government to release military documents on the killing of Sankara after his widow accused France of masterminding the assassination. In 2021, 34 years after the assassination, former President Compeore and 13 others were indicted for complicity in the murder of Sankara as well as other crimes in the coup. This development came as part of President Roch Kimbore's framework of national reconciliation. In October 2021, the trial against Campeore and 13 others began in Ouagadougou, with Campeore being tried in absentia. Where is he? Ex-presidential security chief Hyacinthe Kefondo was also tried in absentia. A week before the trial, Campeore's lawyer stated he wouldn't be attending the trial, which they characterized as having defects, and also emphasized his privilege for immunity being former head of state. Oh, lovely. Yeah, um, we're just not going to show up to your trial because um, your trial's gay, and also, like, I was dictator for 27 years, so I can't be tried. After requests made by the defense attorneys for more time to prepare their defense, the hearing was postponed until the 1st of March. On the 6th of April, 2022, just a few months ago, Campeora and two others were found guilty and sentenced to life in prison in absentia. Eight others were sentenced to between 30 and 20 years in prison. Three were found innocent. And where is Campeora now? In absentia, where is he now? Where he fled to the Ivory Coast, a French allied country that he named as one of the uh, one of the foreign policy uh, 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 reasons he couped Sankara, an ally to the West, a traitor to the revolution to the end. The Ivory Coast is dictatory as fuck too. Yes. Look at his nickname. Handsome Blase. Not likely. Photo of Sankara and his wife playing guitar. Man. They jamming. A statue of Sankara was unveiled in 2019 at the location in Ouagadougou, where he was assassinated, 
However, due to complaints, it did not match his facial features. A new statue was unveiled that, that, later that year. Oh, that ha that happens, you know. It's been it's been known to happen. This is the corrected statue, which looks like him and looks pretty good. In in my opinion, I think okay, this is the old statue. Yeah, they're right. This doesn't look like him. Doesn't look like Sinkara. Whatever, stuff like that happens. Statue making is tough. I feel I feel sympathy for statue makers whose products don't get received well. That's gotta feel really bad, you know? Like it's it's tough. It is really tough making a you know, making a a statue. So, you know. Uh, whatever. Um there's one more thing that I want to learn about. Charles Taylor. This is the guy who's accused or no? Who's the person who has been accused of being the um the French connection to Sankara's assassination? No, not Campeora. Prince Prince Taylor? That's Charles Taylor. Prince Johnson? I don't see a mention of Sankara here either. No, we know that one, Vegar. Burkina Faso wants France to release Sankara archives. This is about the trial? Okay. One more look at this. So this is the guy who orchestrated Sankara's assassination. And then he went on to be dictator for 27 years. I guess the main problem that I have with people giving Sankara shit is that, like, take a look at Africa in the 1980s. I feel like he was the least authoritarian guy. <laughs> And it's like, you have to back up a little bit, right? It's like, damn, you know, he may have improved the lives of millions of impoverished people, but he did kind of like clamp down on political rights a bit. And then you step back and look at Africa broadly, and it's full of like literal monsters who, who like have rape palaces and just occasionally send death squads to like murder entire ethnic groups within their own borders, you know? Um, yeah, like, it, yeah, it's like, fuck, you know? Campora was elected as the president of Burkina Faso in 1991 in an election boycotted by the main opposition parties and protested the questionable means Campora had used to take office in the first place. Only 25% of the electorate voted. In 1998, he was re-elected for the first time. In 2003, numerous alleged plotters were arrested following accusations of a coup plot against Campora. In August 2005, he announced his intention to contest the next presidential election. Wait, he announced his intention to contest the next presidential election? Like, hey, just to let you guys know, the next one, like, uh, what? Opposition politicians regarded this as unconstitutional due to a constitutional amendment in 2000, limiting a president to two terms, reducing term lengths from seven to five years. Okay, so he just, like, bent the rules of the Constitution. After he was um, removed through popular revolt, Kampora announced he left the presidency and there was a power vacuum. He also called for a free and transparent election within 90 days. After tw 27 years of being a dictator, after killing Sankara, he's like, guys, 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 come on. I fucking hate these people. Sorry, just looking up some uh, GDP data. Um, well, I guess the only thing left to do since we ended up learning so much about Burkina Faso is uh, now we just need to see where it's at right now, considering the fact that they had a literal fucking coup, um, like, a week ago. They had, they had a coup a week ago. Where's, just let me click on Burkina Faso. Wild dope fiend master. You're not gonna make me type, are you? Oh, here. Okay. Okay. 2015 general election. This is after the dipshit. Okay. Campeore. The party of former President Campeore, the Congress for Democracy and Progress, was banned from presenting a presidential candidate in the presidential elections, but was still able to participate in the parliamentary election. Dope. Gotcha, Vorsherder. Oh, God. Fuck. I can only learn about so many things in one day. November 2020 election. Rockmar Christian Kabore with the MPP party was elected. This guy. But then in 2022, 
In January of 2022, he was deposed. A coup d'etat was launched. Gunfire erupted. Soldiers were reported to have seized control of the military base in the capital. Tabori was reported to have been detained by soldiers. Deposed from the presidency. The coup d'etat was led by Paul Henry Sandalgo de Miba. A statement from the Twitter account of Kabora urged dialogue and invited the opposing soldiers to lay down their arms. So this guy ruled the country for eight months. Interim president from the end of January to the end of September. With Demiba at its head, the patriotic movement for safeguard and restoration military junta pledged to improve security and restore civilian rule. However, the military regime failed to defeat the jihadists. Right, because they're being attacked by ISIS 24-7. Instead, rebels and other non-state actors even expanded their operation and controlled 40% of the country by September 2022. Wait, how much of Burkina Faso does ISIS control? All these articles are in French! God damn it. Oh, by the way, it's, pe it's, it's shit like the assassination of Sankara that makes ISIS what it is. Remember, ISIS wants a new caliphate to oppose um, Western imperialism. Uh, you, you have a majority Islamic country like Burkina Faso, where a leader of the people is essentially like killed by foreign interests. Um, like we do this, we made this. We keep doing this. Of course, ISIS would not have liked Sankara specifically, what with them being fascists and him being a Marxist, but it's the broader tendency. Went into exile in Togo. The January 2022 coup was widely popular in Burkina Faso. Demiba has become known for the red beret he wears during speeches, believed to be an impression of Burkinabe revolutionary and founding father Thomas Sankara, whose speeches also carried similar rhetoric to Demiba's. Demiba had already gained praise prior to the coup for his activities fighting jihadists. When Demiba proved to be unable to contain the insurgency, public support for him declined sharply. When he was overthrown one week ago, groups in the capital gathered to express support for those who had deposed him. Okay, and then finally, we now arrive at the now. Is there a section here on IS fucking them over? Yeah, terrorist attacks. And now we have the current coup. A coup d'etat took place one week ago because this guy wasn't good enough at fighting Islamists or whatever, jihadists. And our new guy, Traore, the coup has also come amidst a push by Russia in recent years to increase its influence in the Sahel region. Oh no. Some of the efforts are led by the Wagner Group, whose founder, Yevgeny Prigozhin, is a close ally of Vladimir Putin. There had also been a growing discontent with France, the main ally of the Sahel countries, in the battle against jihadists in the region, including in Burkina Faso, in recent years. Many in the country have preferred replacing France with Russia. <sighs> Prigozhin has attempted to influence the anti-French sentiment in the Sahel through troll farms. Oh, Russian internet manufactured controversy. Before the coup, the military was divided over whether to replace France with other institutional par international partners, especially Russia. Amoeba, however, has deci had decided against it. Okay, so the West consistently fails a colonized uh, a, a nation, and eventually they turn towards another. Yeah, yeah. If it wasn't for Western powers being so fucking racist and so fucking greedy, we could be allies with, like, the entire world. We could be allies with, like, basically all of Africa, South and Latin America, and Southeast Asia. If we were just a little bit less shitty, we, could, we, had, the, we had the money and the political stability to lead the world. Um, but nope. The very subtle logo of the Wagner Group in Burkina Faso. Following more than six years of a jihadist insurgency in Burkina Faso, a coup d'etat took place in 2022. One day after the coup, Alexander Ivanov, the official representative of Russian military trainers in the CAR, offered training to the Burkinese military, Burkinese military. Subsequently, it was revealed that shortly before the military takeover, Lieutenant Colonel Demiba attempted to persuade President Kibori to engage the Wagner Group against the Islamist insurgents. In addition, less than two weeks before the takeover, the government announced it had thwarted a coup plot, after which it was speculated the Wagner Group might try to establish itself in Burkina Faso. The coup found significant support in the country and was followed by protests against France and in support of the taker, with the protesters calling for Russia to intervene. 
The U.S. Department of Defense stated it was aware of allegations that the Wagner Group may have been a force behind the military takeover in Burkina Faso, but could not confirm if that were true. Life sure is happening. This literally happened a week ago. It's so difficult to even know anything in Burkina Faso because the country is too poor to even be a recipient of the kind of like Pew Research polling that you would see in other countries. Like, I just googled popularity of Sankara in Burkina Faso, uh, Burkina Faso, and I don't know. You can get like anecdotes, you can hear about popular support, but nobody's going around like person to person asking them over there. It's just too poor and too dangerous. I can't find his actual gun, but it was a Tokarev with pro grip, so it could have been like option one more tame or option two fully decked out. I'd like to believe that Sankara's pistol was just uh like just like a drug dealer pistol, like gold with engravings and stuff. That's what I want to believe. That's what I want to believe in my heart. We haven't heard the man's voice. Not a pee. Produit. Suffisamment. What do all these other countries want with Burkina Faso? It's always about broader power games. The main reason colonial powers have kept the heel down on their former colonial properties is, like, frankly, they don't want, like, blacks getting uppity. That's literally it. I'm being serious. Like, there has been a massive effort on the part of the former colonial powers of Africa, like, Western European powers. Like, if you if you let them, like, like attain true autonomy and really develop, like, that... You know, it's it, it, uh, the England's done the same shit with uh, with India. Like a lot of it is really just it's not just spite. It's also part of the imperial power doctrine, right? Like it's the reason why British imperialists maintain that, like, actually imperialism was good in India. Like maybe we killed a bunch of people. Sure. But we laid down railroads, right? Like from the perspective of the imperialist. The Western power, the imperial power has to be the center of civilization in all that they touch. So to allow autonomy, to allow development, to allow power in a former colonial state, like that is an attack on the sort of the epistemic supremacy of the colonial power. De quoi nous nourrir? Nous pouvons dépasser même notre production, malheureusement. Par manque d'organisation, nous sommes encore obligés de tendre la main pour demander des aides alimentaires. Ces aides alimentaires qui nous bloquent qui nous inspire, qui installe dans nos esprits cette habitude, ces réflexes de mendiants, d'assister. Nous devons mettre de côté ces aides par notre grande production. Il faut réussir à produire plus. Produire plus. Left produire plus audience. parce que <laughs> il est normal que celui qui vous donne à manger vous dicte également. C'est volonté. Nous consommons que ce que nous contrôlons. Il y en a qui demandent, mais où se trouve l'impérialisme L'impérialisme, regardez dans vos assiettes. Quand vous mangez, les grains de, les grains de riz, de maïs, de mille importés, c'est ça, c'est ça l'impérialisme. N'allez pas plus loin. N'allons pas plus loin. Qui ici ne souhaite pas que la dette soit purement simplement effacée Celui qui ne le souhaite pas, il peut sortir, prendre son avion et aller tout de suite à la Banque mondiale payer. Tous nous souhaitons. Notre conférence adopte la nécessité de dire clairement que nous ne pouvons pas payer la dette. Non pas dans un esprit belliqueux, belliciste. Ceci pour éviter que nous n'allions individuellement nous faire assassiner. Si le Burkina Faso tout seul refuse de payer la dette, je ne serai pas là à la prochaine conférence. Bosch, the Wagner Group supported the people that were just overthrown, not the guys overthrowing them. I think you misread it. Aren't they, aren't, are, isn't the current, the, the most recent overthrow, like still the Wagner Group's trying to vie for control there? Gotcha, okay, so the, so the, tw the, the January 2022 coup was the Wagner Group, like, making the direct effort, and now it's like... Whatever is going on over there, it's not good. Par contre, avec le soutien de tous dont j'ai besoin, et quand nous disons que la dette ne saurait être payée, ce n'est point que nous sommes contre la morale 
la dignité, le respect de la parole. Parce que nous estimons que nous n'avons pas la même morale que les autres. All right, I'm calling it. I'm calling this research stream. It's been two hours, 15 minutes, and I'm calling it. I'd say Thomas Sankara is based. Of all the revolutionary leaders that I've learned about, I think he has the highest ratio of good shit to bad shit. Um, every bad thing that I see attributed to him is either, like, dubious, or, if it can be substantiated, seems highly justified by the incredibly difficult circumstances that he was working under. Uh, I guess the, the I, I mean, the broadest criticism you could make is that he didn't stay alive longer. You know what would have saved him? If he had killed his former compatriot or arrested him. The, the best thing he could have done for the people of Burkina Faso was killing that piece of shit before he was uh, cooed by him. That would have been better for the people of Burkina Faso. It's unfortunate that Burkina Faso exists in a state where that is like the the preferable... Vosh, I mean, capital punishment's still bad. This That is a circumstance that you and I get to enjoy. Like, we get to feel that way. If you're, if we, we have, if there are African warlords um, and former imperial powers, like, gunning each other over, like, dictatorial control over the poorest people on Earth, um, it, it's not capital punishment to kill the person trying to coup you. Sankar was killed by him. Him and his, uh, 12 of his, his cabinet members. Maybe ask Karva. I mean, what, what do we learn from this, right? Uh, make sure you do not lose the faith of the military. Um, you know, make, make sure you, 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 you stay in the good graces of the military, of course. Um, and don't get cooed, you know? Don't get cooed. Democracy is great and everything, but if, if attempts at political freedom essentially guarantee that you're going to get shot in the back of the head and replaced with a fascist who will rule for 30 years, then fuck it. Shoot the fascist first. Yeah. I, I, will, I will not be one of those Westerners who will go like, um, maybe he could have done that a little nicer. You know, like, yeah. I mean, if, the, if, those are the, if those are the options that you have, me losing every conflict ever in human history um, because I refuse to do any of the things that any country does in wartime or in times of, like, um, desperate circumstance.